Earlier this week, the chairman of the Cherry Jagan International Airport Corporation, Mr. Ramesh Duku, uh, past president of the Private Sector Commission, was lamenting the fact about the consequences of the cuts to the allocation for the Chedi Jagan International Airport Corporation during the 2013 budget. Well, for years now, I have been trying to get copies of the annual financial statements and annual reports of the Chedi Jagan International Airport Corporation, which I should let you know is a corporation formed under the Public Corporations Act. And that requires every six months, no more than six months, the annual financial statements and annual report of the corporation be submitted to the relevant minister. And the minister tables these in the National Assembly. Well, guess what? For over 10 years, the Chedi Jagan International Airport Corporation had done no such thing. In fact, it wasn't until 2013 that reports were finally tabled in the National Assembly. And guess what further? The reports were incomplete. There are two reports, in fact, that are required in respect of each year. The audited financial statements and the director's report. There was no director's report for any of those years. It is to me a pathetic state of affairs that our National Assembly would accept financial annual reports that are not in keeping with the law. Indeed, the audit was done by the Auditor General who loves to point out certain corporations that might be in default. He did not point out the Chedi Jagan International Airport Corporation. Worse yet, when you look at the financial statements, in every single year between 2002 and 2010, the Chedi Jagan International Airport Corporation has made significant losses. In fact, by the end of 2010, the accumulated losses, which our lame duck audit office described as net loss, accumulated losses were $2.626 billion. That is $2,626 million of accumulated losses. Now, these people who are breaking the law who are not complying with the statutory requirement in relation to Parliament, who can't run an efficient, profitable organization, are now insisting the taxpayers' money, for the billion dollars of taxpayers' money, be put into their hands for them to further mismanage and miscontrol. Business page earlier today has addressed this matter in greater depth. I'll be back with Plain Talk in a moment. Welcome again. Two Fridays ago, the book Sitting on a Racial Volcano was launched. It is a book about race, racial politics, racial division, and racial discontentment. By its own description, it is a provocative book. And so, instead of telling you about it, I thought it best to invite its author Mr. G.H.K. Lal, a regular contributor to the letter columns of the National Press. Mr. Lal, welcome to Plain Talk. Thank you. 
what prompted you to write a book on the very provocative issue of race? I have been thinking of the idea for many years because I have seen how surface thin our race relations are in this country. But it all came to a head last year. I'm sitting in my hammock in the city and there are reports from church people that tires are burning in Agricola. Now I went to school in Agricola for a brief period. To make compress this story, through that night I have no or no videos of what is going on, but I have people in my home, people of Indian ancestry, a little child who can go home because he lives on the East Bank past Agricola. I have people of mixed ancestry who were all marooned in my home. The next day we knew what took place. The parent of that child, an Indian child, accompanied by a close black friend, went into Agricola and they in turn were marooned in the Makdum Masjid where I got eyewitness accounts of what was going on. Clearly, Mr. Ram, what we have been denying, what we have been wasting a lot of time talking about, fooling the people about unity and brotherhood does not exist because Agricola showed us not how one word or one incident but how a community can explode and bring this country, all the people who are near and distant, to the rec recognition of where we are in terms of our race relations. But is it not true as well, Mr. Lal, that that issue subsided rather quickly? It does appear to have been isolated and it does not represent a general national problem? I, I must disagree with that. Sure. And I must disagree with that rather strenuously because every person that I've talked to, black and Indian, and I, and I focused mainly on, the, on, on these two major races, in different areas, from different walks of life, whether from Linden where I do visits, doing other work, volunteer work, whether on the East Coast or in New Amsterdam, there is this deep sense that we have a problem. And the bottom line is, how have we kept the lid on this thing for so long? So Agricola is not isolated. Agricola is not looked upon as isolation. In fact, in the aftermath of the Agricola, the next day and the next days, there was this tension in the air, this fear that there were people or there were busloads coming down from Linden and from other communities, and that suddenly Georgetown tensed. More specifically, perhaps the Indian community tensed. But that didn't happen. The, it didn't the, happen. The bus didn't take place. It, no, it did not happen. But the underlying feeling, the underlying emotion that it is there and it's raw. Who is the, what is the target audience of this book? All Guyanese, all Guyanese who read, but more, but who think, who have a sense of that things are not the way we are. Because when, as a young man, as a junior, the most junior civil servant, I worked during the Burnham years before I went away, and I knew what it is for the Indian man to be left out in the wilderness. We migrated. Now this, the, the reverse is true, and where the black man is left on the outside. So the target audience is those who have been there, like myself, those who have grown up with it, and now those who are experiencing it. So in, in, in actual fact, the target audience is the entire spectrum of Guyanese to see that we have this problem, which I consider grave, which nothing is being done about because nobody's listening to it. And let us do so. Let's be aware of it first, and let us then work towards seeing how we can mitigate the situation. That's a that's a, a, a noble objective. Um, it's 
and the fact that you say you're trying to appeal to the entire cross section of the Guyanese population, do they in fact read? Are they are they likely to buy a book um, of 166 pages and read it? Is that your experience? You're a teacher now as well. I yeah. I understand. Yes. Um, the sad fact is that many Guyanese do not read, uh, and I've heard that from different people and who have been resident here for a long time, we do not read. I, for one, read, a new, I, I, as you know, I'm a contributor to the newspaper free, fairly frequently now. I hardly read the newspapers. I skim it and I move along. So therefore, I think the, the, the accurate answer to your question is, will they read 166 plus 16 pages of prologues and introduction, almost 200 pages? Um, maybe, maybe not. But I can tell you this. The reaction in the week since this book has come out has been, there is this thing, there is this thing that is circulating out there that is one, raising hackles, two, raising interest, and three, generating all kinds of, I don't want to say excitement, but what is this, what is this man saying here? What is he trying to say and what does it mean for me? So. I believe that this book, like the other one, will appeal to people and they will at least want to see what is in its pages. Whether they read the entire thing or not is another story. Do you, Mr. Lal, subscribe to the view um, that race and party, which were once regarded as intertwined in something of a Gordian knot, are now much more nuanced? Or do you think it's still raw and crude? Uh, there, there, are two, there are two pieces or two answers to that question. Publicly, it's nuanced. It's very, very subtle. Everybody says the right thing because we live in politically correct times. Nobody will use the N word or the C word anymore. When's the last time you heard a slur uttered publicly? On the other hand, when we are with our own, we mati, as we say, or we are in the community, our strongholds, we revert, we revert to form. And it becomes raw, it becomes charged, and it becomes emotionally ex instigator, instigating where we want to get people to perpetuate what has always existed. So yes, it is subtle and nuanced, and yes, it is raw. Um, I went through, I, I read the book. I had to read it from cover to cover. Um, I thought you gave some examples of that. Winston Murray, yes. as he challenged for the leadership mm -hmm. of the PNC and the bottom house messages that the PVP is famously associated with. Yes, sir. Yes, indeed. What are those messages? That, that, that you've, you've conveyed in the book. The messages of this, let's take um, the late Mr. Murray. No matter how much you do, no matter how far and how dedicated and how loyal and how active you've been, at the end of the day, we are still so hopelessly, inherently polarized that... This is on page, page 70. Yeah, that uh, Winston Murray cannot rise to the top. As I said in there, sitting MP, Bornham then left this party for this kind of man for coming and run it. Roger Luncheon ran into the same problem, but it was not as, as distinct uh, as, as Winston's. The bottom house thing now, every leader will come out and say at Pagua, I could stand up and hear them at Easter at Christmas, you know, we're a in, multicultural society. In those meaningless and messages. Yes, exactly. And we must move forward in nationhood. It is, it's a joke. It's a lie, Mr. Ram. It's a lie because when, when they're at Babu John or in, or in Agricola or wherever the place may be that is kith and kin, is Mimati, Creolese, it's like, don't forget what you got to do, you know. Don't forget where you belong. Don't forget who you are and who we are. That's what it comes down to. To the detriment of this entire country, including their audience. 
I notice one of the things you didn't do, um, and obviously we are here to discuss some of the things you, you did in the book, you didn't go back to the historical origins of racism in Ghana. No, sir. Deliberate. Was that, uh, yeah. Could you explain the reason for that? It was deliberate because uh, as a contributor to the columns, as a reader, as someone who has lived 30 years outside, I keep seeing, I keep seeing and hearing and reading and discerning about Burnham and Jagan, and they, have be, they were stalwarts, and they did a lot for this country. Depends on the perspective that was good or bad. A man said this week, I can't believe an Indian man write a book like this. What does it matter that I'm Indian or black or mixed? The fact that this, a book like this has been written, that somebody dares to write it and put on the table what we have about what we have presently, I think is the start of the conversation. Now, to your question about why I didn't go back, I feel that we have dug up enough, we have angered and incensed each other enough that I wanted not to go there, not to walk that path. For one, I'm not sufficiently equipped to do it. Perhaps a little bit more accurately, I was a little lazy. And third, this is what I live. You, you couldn't have been lazy to produce this. Uh, this is what time. I live. This is what I know. This is what I've listened to. This is what I've seen here and where I've come from. Lots of people, of course. I, I mean, I, I know what you, well, I'm thinking that maybe you think we, we're talking about the 60s. I wanted to take it further back because one of the things about history, you can't discuss history 10 years after. Even though some, some people in our country like to discuss history yesterday. Did, did, did our racial conflict really start in 1838 when Indians came to Guyana, were brought to Guyana to, re, to, to replace the labor that had hitherto been provided free of charge by African slaves and then come distorted, which is what the, the white man's work, distorted the labor market, the, the demand and supply for labor, etc. Is there any value in that? I, 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 I must say, any, any reasonably intelligent person looking at that would, would subscribe partially to that. But I think if you're going to go that far back, and I agree with you, and that's why I said the part about laziness, the then you're going to have to go back now to cultural and religious roots that, go, that goes back thousands of years. The differences from Africa and Asia that found itself here in the old British Guyana, now there's the labor market competition. So what, is our, what are our mindsets? What the caste system, you know, the tribals, the tribalisms? That, and, and that, to me, was beyond the scope of this book. But yes, I would say that that's a little part of it, and that was exploited as we came down through the decades into the 19th, the 20th century, and certainly it mushroomed in, in the 50s, 60s, and thereafter. We talked about this, at least, and I think we agree publicly, there's a, a, a nuance, um, there's a subtlety about how race is discussed in the political parties. But I, I, I want to pursue that point, Mr. Lal, because if I take the example of the PPP, its prime minister is what your book will call a black man. Um, many believe that no decision by this government, even under the autocratic Barajagdio, was taken unless it was endorsed by Roger Longchon. You describe him as the chief ruling party spokesman, government salesman in chief. It's power man, the PPP's power man, um, though he's more in business these days than in power, Odinga Lumumba, and its public face of robust action is Robes and Ben. The PPP can't be accused of being racist or practicing racial policies or exploiting racism, can it? My answer to that question, Mr. Ram, has to be very blunt. There's something called tokenism. There's symbolism. 
there are these handfuls of handful of people. There is this handful of people, and it is a handful in positions that have a ha that has a, have had a long association with the PPP, Ben Luncheon, and others who are black, who are good at what they do. But it stops there. It stops there. Let's go outside of the public faces and see, talk about New Amsterdam, talk about contract awards, talk about the foreign service, talk about the teaching service, talk about the black unions that are treated differently versus their Indian counterparts and neighbors. So yes, we do. I must acknowledge Mr. Hines, Dr. Luncheon, Mr. Ben, and others. I think it's good public relations. And it's no more than that. Um, then would you say it's the same is true of the APNU, where the vice chairman is an Indian, and APNU MPs will tell you that they can do nothing if Ms. Amna Ali does not, in the, they can do nothing in the National Assembly, unless it's blessed by Ms. Amna Ali, both of them Indians. I, I say the same thing. I say the same thing that I said for the PPP. I, I say the same thing that we need to have these faces, we need to have these Indian names that are there, but at the end of the day, they are representative of not much. In the epilogue to the book, you make an indirect call, a call to prayer, not like the Muslims, I take it, just the daily prayer, but no doubt because earlier you stated that the people sit on top of a known, restless, threatening volcano, that sooner or later the pent-up forces of frustration and rage will shatter restraints and blow away those in the path. What's the basis for such alarming pessimism? Look all over, Mr. Ram. Look where minorities are smaller statistically. It could be economic, it could be religious, it could be tribal, it could be whatever. It's, it's, a, whole chap it's a part of a chapter in the book where they are like, we don't want this anymore, no matter how benevolent it is. Some of the countries? The Philippines, Abu Sayyaf, the Naxalites in India. Um, Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka, the Chechens in Russia, the, the, China, the Uyghurs in, in, in Manchuria. I mean, these guys are dropping and I think you mentioned Shreshmanids here as well. Yes, yes. So what I'm saying here, again, it goes back to where we started. We go about our day-to-day, -day, but there's this distance. There's this tension that can change on a, on a $5 coin. Is it a $5 coin? I yeah. think so. Uh, or $10 or whatever. It can change in an instant. In and people were going home in Agricola. The next moment they can't go anywhere. We could have that here if people decided to to um, to take matters into their own hands. And there is so much discontent. I hear it every day, and I hear it from everyone in the marketplace, in the taxis, in the streets, in the churches. Even though our churches are divided, Mr. Ram. Even our churches are divided. They are PPP factions and they are non-PPP factions. You can imagine where they'll leave a guy like me. I'm in no man's land. I'm in Vietnam, the demilitarized zone, I believe. There, there's a view that, look, it, in an economy that is expanding, that is growing where the pie is being, um, even if inequitably distributed where people have a whole slot, they have a stake in society, that they're no longer interested in race. Have you, have, have you considered that? Have you dealt with that? You talk about house slots. Unless I have six figures, I can't go on the land. I know people who have come to ask me to help them to get towards that six figure. 
So it's a nice thing. We know about the numbers of house lots. But at the end of the day... Six figures for oh, the audience means hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yes. At the end of the day, there is a struggle for people to send their children to school, and I don't mean private schools. There is a struggle, despite all the improvements for transportation. We are a $100 minibus fare, and the man keep back the $20 change. Becomes a problem where we have too few getting too much of the pie, and they all happen to be like me and you, for the most part, and the rest in are... Terms of, in terms of appearance, perhaps. Yes. And, thank you, and the rest are out there hustling to scratch out a living. Clearly, clearly, this can't continue for too long. This is being buttressed also by monies coming from outside, by family helping to make that stake in the ground or to keep going from day to day. So I will disagree with you that the anger, the interest may be, the interest may be dissipated or diminished to some extent, but the discontent is there and it's festering and it's problematic. Later on we'll get into possible solutions, but um, I was particularly struck and in fact someone called my attention to the fact that in your epilogue, your final page, you said, and uh, quoting I think um, John F. Kennedy about the, the issue of prayer. Now, Mr. Lal, you must be a very courageous man because you describe the subject of race as taboo, but you are prepared, you yourself are prepared to confront it with a raw, provocative book, to peel away the mask, to let the truth be told. Is this a case of a fool rushing in where angels fear to tread? Well, uh, there are a couple of things here, Mr. Ram. The first thing, for 18 months I stood by and watched a woman, dear to me, face, get up from her bed and go out and fight a battle with something called chemotherapy. And it would knock her down and then she would get up and go again. I mean, the woman had no fear. You're speaking of your wife? Yes. Whatever fear I had went then too. The second part about this is that I've come back here and I'm trying to live a quiet, <laughs> you might laugh at that, <laughs> Christian <laughs> this life. Is not, this is not quite quiet, right. is it? <laughs> a Christian life. But I want to make my environment better. I want to lift everybody up, including myself. Which is the duty of every citizen of yes. this country. Maybe I'm trying a little harder, maybe a bit more vociferously, a bit more pointedly. So I don't see it, I, I don't see it as courage. As the Speaker of the House, who gave the opening remarks to this, said to me in a conversation, he said, listen, don't fight this thing. Let it carry you where it's going to carry you. You don't know the answer, you don't know all the answers, and I willingly confess to that. So that's my position. If this is where I'm being guided to open our eyes, to table this, to share it, then let it be. In fact, um, I must correct myself, the quotation is from Robert, Robert Kennedy. Um, when he learned of the killing of Martin Luther King, he encouraged his audience to say a prayer for our country. Let us pray for the people. GHK Lal says, I say it is right to pray for ourselves too. Now is the time to go. We shall take an ad break at this time. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Plain Talk as we discuss with Mr. G.H.K. Lal his book, Sitting on a Racial Volcano. Mr. Lal, you described the PPP in a chapter called A Catalog of Racial Instigation, Injustice and Injury as engaging in a strategy of mind and fear mongering, mind games and fear mongering, which yields results. How does the PPP manage to do this? 
tribal loyalty. That's the first ingredient. The second thing is that it continuously, perpetually harks backwards in time to what the realities of the 60s and 70s were. Lines, flight, crime, choke and rob, um, the black man in power, the squeeze on the Indian man, the shortage of peas, dal, and aloo, and what it meant for us, and the fact that, that Indians had to, to take flight. So they're able to do this, and especially in the aftermath of the earlier elections when the PPP came back into power, when the response was street violence. And I mean, this fuels Indian anxieties and, and, and concerns. So they're able to, they have a ready audience. But surely the, the Indians um, would understand, and, and you spoke of the intelligent Indian man, as thoughtful man, including woman, critical and discerning, having a mind of his own and a conscience too, but racial to a fault. That must be a contradiction. I don't see it as a contradiction. Here is someone, a composite, a group, within a, a subgroup, that sees things as they are and says, this can't be what I'm a part of politically. He sees it. He sees the excesses every day in terms of the fraud, the division, the outright lies, the mismanagement, and yet he's like, I have no other choice. I have no other option because I do not want to return or I don't want to give the other man a chance. But does he also, does he also see the truth that look, yes, the PNC banned a whole range of items, lots of them with the agreement and critical support, etc of the PPP um, in terms of its economic policies, but that it was the PNC under Desmond Hoyt who liberalized the market and restored access to all of those things? Doesn't the Indian man, as you describe him, see these things? Of course he sees those things, Mr. Ram, but he sees it how he wants to see it, meaning, yes, it was a start, yes, it was remediating, yes, it was good, but here's it. I am where I am now, and despite the fact where the ruling party is, which is of me, which I would like to be better, which I would like to be exponentially better, but I got to stick with this. I am sticking with this. If I have to describe it, to tell you... Could, could I interrupt you for a minute, Sure, please? by all means. I, I want to share with the audience, I think it will remember Watergate. It's a pretty well Watergate incident in, that brought down President Nixon. He had an attorney general by the name of Elliot Richardson, rock rib Republican. <laughs> After the thing started to deteriorate, they appointed Archie Cox, Harvard Law, just like Mr. Richardson, special as the prosecutor. special prosecutor. Cox came on and said, I will take this job only if I have free reign, Richardson assured him. As Cox started his investigation, he came up on all these smoking guns. Nixon said to Richardson, Republican President Richard Nixon said to Attorney General Republican Richardson, fire him. Richardson said, no, I cannot and I will not. He said, I'm telling you, you've got to fire That's him. The Saturday massacre. And then, and here's a Republican president asking a Republican attorney general to fire a Democratic special prosecutor. Richardson resigned. The number two man resigned also. Principle. The highest of ethics that we, ha that, we, that we had there on full public display that brought down a president. In this country, we have people within the party who are perhaps clear-headed, who are perhaps thinking, who are Indian, but who are silent. When is the last time somebody resigned? 
When is the last time somebody protested and said, I am out of here because of what has happened? It has not happened because the pie is too sweet, life is too good. So all of them you are saying is compromise, is that correct? Yes, sir. I think you said um, stalwarts from top to bottom in both major political camps are compromised, their hands stained in blood. Is that literal or figurative? Uh, some of it is literal. Blood the money, blood circumstances, and they know what we're talking about. They know what we're talking about. Does the term camps here include the AFC? Stalwarts from top to bottom in major political camps are compromised, their hands stained in blood. Does the term camps include the AFC here? I would say it has to. It has to, given the composition of the AFC. It has to, but primarily remember my thrust here is the two major races and the two major parties. They have called all the shots, they have made all the decisions, and they must live, and we must live with the results of what we live with. In your commentary on what has taken place since November 28, 2011, you described the new dispensation as more of the same old shabby, worm-infested story of the last 10 to 15 years. Are you suggesting that there is no difference between a Jagdeo-led administration and a Ramatar-led administration on the one hand and a Corbyn-led opposition and a Granger-led opposition on the other? Well, I think you've got about four questions in there, so <laughs> let's, let's, let's see if we can address uh, A Jagdeo-led administration, the best I can say about it, that is mentionable for public consumption, it, is, it was obscene. It remains obscene to this day. And that's the best? That's the best I can say. A Ramutar administration, as young as it is, or not so old, is really qualitatively not considerably different. It is not considerably different because it's the same things, the same policies, but done in not so confrontational and so crass a way. So that's the first two questions. Question C and D, a Corbyn versus a Granger. I think Mr. Corbyn has done some irreparable harm to this country as opposition leader. I am all for cooperation. I'm all for collaboration. I'm all for all these things about consensus building, etc. But I think he made it into an art form that is regrettable. And, and the rest of the population speaks about this in the most disparaging of terms. The last part of your question was about a Granger-led opposition. I think the brigadier is a good manager. I don't think he's such a good politician. Because, every, and I said that in, there, in here, it seems that almost every step of the way, the PPP outpolitics him, outstreets him. I, I, I get the sense that he is very methodical in his, report, in his approach. But I don't see this as a management situation. I see this as a political situation that is continuously, uh, continuously fluid, that's on the move. And sometimes I feel that he's left behind. Is it better now than it was before? I would say yes. We saw some movement in the 2000, 2013 budget. E except you said more of the same old shabby worm infested story of the last 10 to 15 years. Yes, uh, and, and I agree that I did say that. But I feel that Mr. Green, that the brigadier has, has maybe raised the, the, the knot, raised it a little bit. Clearly, clearly, let, let's take that a, a step further. Do we really have a viable opposition in this country? And, and you ask anybody, they'll tell you no. And I think you said no in your book as well. Yes. Not. So that's the beginning and the end of the story. Now, I must link this again to the question of race. How is this new dispensation and a continuation? How do you tie the, the, the race knot to that? 
the no dispensation has this number, this one seat majority that has its work cut out for it. It has to tread very delicately. We live in different times. I think in another time, there would have been a reversal. The Americans would have taken care of that, as they normally do, right? They would have taken care of, of these, of something that, that is a bone in their throat. The PPP knows this and fears this, but we live in different times. The, the opposition also knows that you don't go into the street anymore and just do what you used to do before. So this whole new dispensation is about moral suasion, about job owning, ab about international pressure, is about saying the right things, is about subtle, subtly applying pressure, budgetary squeezes, about accountability, about transparency. But quite frankly, I don't think they're getting far with it. The new dispensation it still doesn't seem to, I, I'm still looking for the new aspects about it. When it was either a political party or a commentator questioned the inep, inep, inexplicable rise of buildings distorting the skyline, it was accused of racial profiling. You yourself have repeated, or, or you've, you've, out of your own, um, experiences, you refer to a largely non-Indian non rectangle Georgetown being converted into a mainly industrial and commercial swamp. Are you yourself engaging in racial profiling here? Well, well I'm sure that the thought would occur to the people who uttered that, that phrase. This was written even before that, that I, I laughed. <laughs> uh, because this book was completed before that statement, that phrase was uttered by whoever made it. I think the history would so, so, say that, yes, indeed. Yeah. So, so, when I said to someone yesterday, when is the last time you saw a house going up in Georgetown? Houses don't go up in Georgetown anymore. What you have are these local skyscrapers. And for the most part, there is some suspicion, considerable and not without basis, about the source of the funding for these structures. So what you have is a residential garden city being transformed, already transformed, into a commercial swamp. Be and I have people who have complained to me, the man who's left with the house and who's looking at five stories, where his ear rights are gone, where his parapet is gone. All, all our parapets are gone in most of the streets if you look at it in Georgetown. So yes, let's go back. It is a, from a, a rectangle garden city, we've gone to a rectangle concrete triangle. And it is essentially powered by one group of people. That's the, that's the fact, we can't deny that. The Yes, but I'm linking it to the question of race. And I want to introduce this. Go ahead. The mayor of the city of Georgetown is, that has responsibility for approval under the building code is the one who, which allows it, the city council allows it. Well, I, I remember I, I wrote a letter, and I mentioned it in my, in my the book before this one, that building my yard up, the guys cut some tree branches and put it on the road, a mistake, for which I readily acknowledge, and within 10 minutes, men were there, hey, what are you doing there? You gotta get this thing off the road or you can get locked up. I wasn't there. And yet, if I walk down streets in Georgetown, I wanna know why I have to walk in the middle of the road. Where is the mayor? Where is the city engineer? Where are these people the, who give the, the, the permits? Point I'm, the point I'm making, though, Mr. Lal, is yes. lots of those persons are blacks. Yes. They're facilitating this gentrification, this, this swampification that you're talking about. Agreed. But the perpetrators, and if I, I see maybe you want a shared perpetration basis. Yes, it is there. No, I'm just asking for an no, explanation. Well, my, 
the fact is, if I don't come to you and say, I'm going to write this book or I want to put up this building and I'm going to, you have to make it possible or you can make it possible because I will make it right for you, then nothing happens. So it is happening because one set of people who have the wherewithal goes about and say, this is what we want to do. And the other set of people who have the authority to grant that permission does it. So yes, it is there. And, and I would say that office is definitely a part of this mix. I, I will not spare that, you know, the mayor and city council from this. Given the book is essentially a current situation looking towards this um, eruption of this racial volcano, is there a suggestion that maybe you have been kinder to the PNC than you are to the PPP, which is currently engaging in, 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 in this campaign um, and strategy that you, you talked about? Well, let me say this. I have heard people who have not read the book, who have not seen it, have not seen it physically, say, oh, it's a pro-opposition book. I mean, I mean, this is the depth to which we have sunk. We would comment, as one man said to me at the launch, we listen with our lips. And, and I, that was a, a profound statement for me. I've never heard it before. And we do indeed, you haven't read the book, but it's a pro-opposition book. I am certainly, I will agree, I have been a bit more hospitable to the opposition because the opposition does not control the reins of power. It does not have the purse. It does not have the authority to do this or that or the other. It can work together to make certain things happen, but I find it's being stonewalled. And that's why I question its efficacy and its relevance. It's strength. The, the efficacy, relevance, and strength of the opposition. Yes. You describe the police service as an emblem of all that is wrong. Once the nemesis of the PPP, now its partner in crime, possessed of an unending reservoir of wrongdoing, from routine corruption to chronic obstruction and maladministration. If we accept the premise that the PPP is essentially an Indian party and the police service a mainly black institution, is that not racial cooperation, albeit of the most undesirable kind? It is convergence of politics and money. It is the strength of the dollar that somebody said yesterday to me, not an intellectual, not a political player, when I see that the PPP could manipulate and maneuver the police force, then I say we're done. This is not me talking. This is not me writing. This is a man in the street, a woman in the street, two of them as a matter of fact, talking to me. Here's the story. We know about the police standing by and protesters being beaten up in the 70s um, in the heyday of the PNC and, the pol and, and et cetera, et cetera. We've heard all those complaints. We've heard about the police being reluctant to move in the early 90s. But what happened has happened. They have been able to work out, to work with the ruling party, where co mutual cover-ups, mutual condoning has occurred, and now everybody decide, has decided, this works for us. It works for me. It works for me at the junior and the senior level, and it comes, it's not so much race anymore and racial cooperation, it's the money tree. It's the gravy train. If, thi if this can happen here, I don't want to hear about opposition. If at the end of the day, money pays the bills, money makes things happen, money talks. This government has been very good at making money talk for people who it wants to work with. So it's the suggestion then that when it comes to crime, um, perhaps Crime knows no racial face. That, that's a fair statement. That's a fair statement. Except in relation, you, you, you dealt fairly significantly on the drug trade and who controls, 
who are the mules and who are the, the drivers. Tell us about the book's treatment of this. We hear about all these master plans, and we hear this, we have this furor and in, imbroglio about anti-money anti laundering legislation. What has happened? What has happened with all this document and all this paper and all this ink? Nothing. We have get guys who just turn up and say guilty because they go and supposedly serve their four years. I understand it's otherwise. And what happens? This trade is dominated by one group of people in this country. That group of people, racially homogenous, is linked to the party. Drugs, money, politics, power, ascendancy, ascendancy, and relegation. Ascendancy for one, relegation for the other. You described the PNC's two major problems as image-related, its ignominious past, and its enduring similarity to the PPP, a mirror image of the other, one a cheat and a thief at the polls, and the other at the public trough, both with a history of violence. Could you elaborate? The PNC started out not started out, has this history where Indians were marginalized, ostracized, squeezed. They, to perpetuate themselves in power, there was violence in the communities, there was violence in the city. The PPP, to perpetuate itself in power, has used violence. It has used the violence in the, after the mass jailbreak, perhaps just for self-protection. We know about a patriot who is in a U.S. Um, jail. So both hands are stained, both parties' hands are stained with blood. Um, one stole votes, the other one steals money. So in effect what I'm saying if given the chance, both, and both have been given the chance, they have failed the citizens of this country. They have failed the citizens of this country across the board. They have served a few of their own to the detriment of the majority. You say that the PNC has been injured the most. By whom and how? By the PPP. By its history, its record, its history, and by the PPP. One, the history of the Poles, the rigging. Two, the history of ancient violence. And three, by the PPP propaganda machinery. I mean, these guys have a lot of money. They have dedicated a lot of personnel to it. And the PNC simply does not have the resources to answer in kind. So it suffers from that image problem some of which is very, very accurate. Um, meaning it's more, than, it's, it's more than just an image, yes. it's, it's a reality. Um, well, <coughs> you, you, you dedicated a small portion of your book, if that is correct, um, to the AFC, um, a relative newcomer on, in, on the block, um, though some of its leaders are not. Um, you say that the AFC's thinking and tactics are self-enfeebling, reducing the party to the role of heckler rather than of a force to be reckoned with. I feel, and we, we bring the corporate world here into play, I feel that the AFC has too many things and leads that it is pursuing. You can't go after every issue. You can't be in the papers every day chasing every red herring. And these guys have provided them with red herring. I do not want, not me. Well, are those red herrings that, that, that um, I mean, if, if you get a story of a corruption or, or, or an abuse of office, would that, is that what you mean by red herring? Or could you elaborate on that? Too? No, here's what I'm saying. Pick three issues. The Marriott Hotel, the, the airport, 
NICIL, three substantial issues. One is corruption, one is narcotics. I'm just picking these at yes. random. One is uh, insecurity or police reform. And just go after that. Constitutional reform, just go after that. You can't be in, you don't have the resources, you don't have the public attention. Remember you said we don't read? You don't have the public attention or the attention span for that period of time, that duration of time, to register with them where you really stand on the important things of the day. Are all these things important? Yes, but you've got to prioritize. You also said that there's no buffer race or block between the two antagonistic races. There can be, though, isn't it, the Amerindians? I, I don't think so. I don't think so because, one, the numbers, at the end of the day, it comes back to the Indian and black, Indian and African. If there was an, if there was an Am Amerindian party that voted solidly along racial, and the people voted solidly along racial lines, the, the PPP would probably lose. Even the PPP would lose its, um, its plurality. I can see that. I can see that. But I still don't believe because, again, the divide and rule, because of the money tree where the PPP can reach, the government has access to these, can reach through its resources, through its arms, into the hinterland communities and compromise them. You dealt, uh, we, we have about three minutes, I think. Um, you dealt also on civil society. Tell us what you think of civil society. I don't think it exists. I don't think it is genuine. They are authentic people. Mr. Ram, for me to get the last book published, the one before this, not published, a, a forum which you and I discussed, they said I'm, I'm, I'm controversial. You can have UC Kwayana or Rupert Wupnerine, known names in this country, political players, go to that forum, but I can't. A letter writer, a stranger. I subsequently found out that part of the people who are responsible for blocking me have their hands in the government's pocket. Money. So, so let's go back to this, the broader question of civil society. We mean well, we speak conveniently, but we do nothing unless it is in our own interests. And that has to stop. Well, and um, maybe we can spend the last couple of minutes on this. How does it stop? I mean, after you were saying, look, forget everything else, just, just kneel down, sit down, cross your legs or however, just pray. How do we, how do you see it stopping? Look, I have taken the first step, writing a book. That's the articulation. Now let's have the discussion. Let us have the mitigation. And I'm saying that we have people in this country, unfortunately not many, who are genuinely concerned about the well-being of the people and welfare of this country. They're not political people. They don't, want, they don't want to be a minister or a president or anything. But they want to see us be better. People who don't want anything, people who want to give. We need to gather those people together. We need to have them in conversation so and the outward ripples can start and that perhaps we can let us see where we really are. This book is not, is an exhortation. It's an appeal. Let us not get there. Well, you know, um, that's, we go back to because you, it seems as though you think a lot of it revolves or is exploited by the political parties. The, PP, the PNC tried to reform. In fact, it made that part of its name. The PPP talks about civic. How do we get there, Mr. Lal? We've got to be less about ourselves. We've got to care about people. We've got to know that there are people who are hungry and hurting out there. And if we care about them, if we can identify with them, if we can empathize with them, then we are ready to do something about them and about this country. The final question, um, two, two questions. Are we going to see a book from you about solution to the crisis beyond prayer, um, which I think you use um, in, in a special sense, in, in some positive action? 
Are we going to see a book from you on that? And you can tell us where, where this book is available and at what price. The easy question first. The book is available at Austin's at $2,500. It's also available on Amazon in paperback and on Kindle. The next step is to gather some people together to talk. Is this real? Do we have a problem? If we do, is it serious? And if it is, or as grave as I think it is, what do we need to do and do early? Some of the people I have in mind, the ACDA, the IAC, the labor people, for starters, just to bring us together, let us talk. No political people just yet. What do we have here? Second, in terms of another book, I've already started on another. As a matter of fact, I have three outlines, one on Wall Street, one on the immigrant experience, the Guyanese immigrant experience, and a third one about life here in Guyana outside of race and politics and corruption. So you're, you're saying that there is? There could, yes, there could be. Mr. Lal, I want to thank you very much for appearing on Plain Talk um, to discuss this explosive book, Sitting on a Racial Volcano. Thank you um, for having me. Viewers, the book is available at Austin's $2,500 per copy. Thank you and good night. See you next week.